everybody. Um, so our second panel for today, How to Tell a Story, Artists' Lives, Artists' Legacies, um, is um, being going to be moderated today by Professor Mia Liu. Uh, Mia Liu is an assistant professor in the Visual Studies program here at California College of the Arts. Previously, she was assistant professor in the Asian Studies program at Bates College in Lewiston, Maine. She received her PhD in art history from the University of Chicago in 2013. Her first book, The Literato Lens, uh, Wen Ren Landscape in Chinese Cinema, 1950 to 1979, is forthcoming in 2019 this year from the University of Hawaii Press. She has published articles on Chinese photography, including the allegorical landscape, Long Jin Shang's Photography in Context in the Archives of Asian Art from 2015, and the emulative portraits, Wang Jingshan's photography of Zhang Dakian in the Trans Asia Photography Review 2015. Her research interests focus on cinema, photography, optical devices, the history of visual apparatuses, and other issues of media in the history of Chinese art and visual culture. Please help me give a warm welcome to Professor Lula Liu. to be uh, the moderator today for this wonderful panel. I have the pleasure of receiving the paper beforehand, so you are all in for a great treat this afternoon. It's marvelous. So um, I also have the honor to uh, introduce our three presenters to you uh, this afternoon in the second panel. So um, first up is John Davies. Uh, is a curator, writer, and PhD candidate in art history at Stanford University. Uh, he received his MA in Film and Media Studies from York University. Before enrolling at Stanford, he was a contemporary art curator in Canada at the Power Plant, Oakville Galleries, and the Art Gallery of Ontario in Toronto. His writing on cinema, media, and contemporary art has been published widely. In 2009, he published a book on Paul Morris' film, Trash. And John's current research focuses on queer pedagogy and the camera as a catalyst for artists' sexual and social experimentation. And then we have uh, Jessica E. Uh, Jessica E is an MA candidate in the Art History and Visual Culture Program at San Jose State University. Her master's thesis focuses on American artist Feliz Gonzalez Torres and issues of reception history, archival practices and access, and theatricality in his work. She earned her BA in Art History and minor in American Studies from San Francisco State University. A strong museum advocate, she has held positions in curatorial education and development across the Bay Area's major institutions. At present, she is manager of the director's office at the San Jose Museum of Art. And Last but not least, uh, Kira dominguez Holbrin is a California-based textile artist. She studied French post-colonial theory and literature at Princeton University and performance and fine arts in Rio Negro, Argentina. Her research interests include material and embodied rhetorics, loom technologies, decolonizing material culture, and analyzing textiles as a performative critique against the visual. In her third year at California College of the Arts, she is earning an MFA in Fine Arts and MA in Visual and Critical Studies. She is presented by Eleanor Harwood, uh, Eleanor Harwood Gallery in San Francisco, where she had her first solo show Wingspan in 2018. Her thesis advisory committee consists of Michelle Carlson, Jackie Francis, and Karen Fiss. 
So uh, let's welcome to welcome them to the podium. Father's death 
um, should be discussed by an American art museum rather than his own family. Vaux's casting of his father as a contractual laborer suggests a precarious state of employment in the neoliberal economic order. While children of immigrants and refugees are often pressured to economically transcend their parents via high earning careers in med medicine or engineering, Vaux's booming art practice allows him to pursue a more perverse path, supporting his family through altern alternative arrangements like these. Vaux notes that, quote, his father never really used his handwriting skills after arriving to Denmark, partly because he never learned to write in any European languages, unquote. The child holds a certain position of power over his elder here. With both affection and a queer detachment from biological bonds, Vaux capitalizes on parents' comparatively less assimilated status, exploiting the gap between uh, his father's manual labor and the child's ability to extract meaning and market value for it as art. Vaux's work is populated by other queer father figures as well, such as Joseph M. Carrier. Carrier worked in Vietnam during the war for the Rand Corporation, but was later fired for being gay. The older man cruised Vaux in Los Angeles, beginning a friendship that resulted in Vaux exhibiting photographs under the title Good Life. The carrier had surreptitiously taken a young Vietnamese man being physically affectionate. So their kind of everyday homosocial behavior becomes reinscribed as homosexual through carriers desiring gays. In their collaboration, the photos and other documents become Ursat's pictures with Vaux, a family album in absentia. He has said, quote, it's a kind of self-portrait where I'm not sure whether I'm Joe or the boys without names, unquote. In a querying of genealogy, Carrier has willed his entire archive to Vaux on his death. Vaux's affiliation with Carrier evidences how queer erotic bonds, such as those forged via cruising, often form against the grain of allegiances to the nation state or other identity categories. Whether anticipating the death of one's father or double casting him as a white gay American, Vaux short circuits paternal procreative powers and engages in a rerouting of generational lineage into the murkier realms of desire. Vaux's work draws its potent power from subjecting the deeply personal to the vicissitudes of the global art market which now traffics in his family's objects, moving through exhibition spaces and collections on almost every continent. Vaux is a ravenous collector. The objects he seeks were touched by very specific people. Rather than holding on to them for himself, he keeps them moving through the art world. Vaux is particularly drawn to everyday objects rendered erratic through touch. The Unabomber's typewriter, for example, is bought at auction and signed by Vaux when it becomes the sculptural element of his own exhibitions and his dealer's inventories. Similarly, Vaux exploits the rubric of contemporary art to recast his father's handwriting or his grand grandmother's belongings as an omatotum as valuable artworks. The artist's brand has the power to turn the most banal objects into gold as long as the market is willing to play along. Advances in reproductive technologies notwithstanding, queerness complicates traditional conceptions of procreation and futurity. The temporal ruptures and idiosyncratic trajectories that mark the time of queer lives are unimaginable without the affects of discourses of migration, diaspora, exile, and unbelonging. Historically, these experiences have complicated, disrupted, and queer familial bonds. David Eng has articulated a concept of queer diaspora based not on ethnic dispersion, affiliation, and biological traceability, but instead on queerness, affiliation, and social contingency. My interest lies in how Vaux fashions queer diasporic strategies within the production and circulation of his work. I'd like to close with a Parquet postcard edition by Vaux, featuring his father's Gothic script reminiscent of that on his tombstone, over an antique photograph of Halong Bay. It reads, born out of a uterus I had nothing to do with, a line by Antony Marteau. In Vaux's postcard, the mother's womb is grafted onto the Gulf of Tonkin, site of the 1964 confrontation between the US and North Vietnamese that escalated the war showing two geological formations emerging out of the water, 
which the vintage postcard informs us are known as Les Deux Frères, or the Two Brothers, so a family structure imposed onto a geologic one. Vaux's work is a powerful statement of alienation both from the mother and the mother country. You might have noticed that Vaux's mother figures much less frequently in his work than his father does. So, in conclusion, while what has been called Vaux's family business subjects their labor and belongings to the art market, such work affects a clear derailing of familial lineage into the precarious performative sphere of the global economy. Highlighting the connections between queer diasporas and processes of transnational capitalism and globalization, here the contemporary art market is what brings perverse forms of desire, exchange, and value to bear onto the biological family, a kinship model that has tended to reproduce itself on question. Thank you. Third 
To fully understand the artist, we must look at these two poles not as contradicting, not as competing contradictions, but as operating under a dialectic. The tension between these two readings produces a profound dichotomy that allows the work to thrive. To understand this, we turn to Gonzalez Torres' own self-proclaimed primary influence to his practice, Bertolt Brecht, the German theater director. Though he cited Brecht in multiple interviews, the scholarship on the relationship is limited, with only one devoted essay on the topic by curator Armada Cruz in 1994. A clear way of his practice is indebted to Brecht is how he dispels of the fourth wall, the imaginary wall between the actors and audience. He does so through physical engagement in his participatory works, such as his beloved candy schools. An untitled portrait of Ross in LA, the ideal weight of candy corresponds to his partner's ideal healthy weight. He invites viewers to not just touch, but imbibe. And then, as such, one by one, the school diminishes. But the artist's relationship to Brecht is much more complex. Brecht's theory of epic theater suggests that play should provoke a rational self-reflection and critical view of the circumstances, begging for a radical separation of the elements. Epic theater rejects the form of dramatic theater, as outlined on the left here, that relies on plot, feeling, and linear development. Rather, as outlined on the right, epic theater's form allows the viewer to see the world as it is, in jumps and curves, through reason and argument, and montage, calling for each scene for itself. In examining the artist's use of theatrical devices, we can use these connections as a tool to unravel the relationship of the artist's practice and everlasting presence through memorabilia available today. Gonzalez Torres employs epic theater's radical separation of elements through language and linguistics, as you see through his use of titles. His works, while largely untitled, often are paired with parenthetical citations. These parentheses offer sound bites of the artist's voice as they seemingly whisper to the audience his own thoughts and connections to his work, as much an aside in theatrical plays offer. Parentheses are defined as a word, clause, or sentence inserted as an explanation or afterthought into a passage that is grammatically complete without it. This means the title, untitled, can stand alone. But Gonzalez Torres inserts its own meaning and its own relationship to the work to be carried with it for eternity. The gesture implies one can initiate their own connection, a type of fill in the blank, with the work on their own terms, just like him. These two separate voices allow for the perceived contradiction at hand. He wants the viewers to complete his work, but he is too amongst the viewers. The tension created in these two readings is thus critical to understanding how his work is able to succeed, ultimately creating a necessary dialectical relationship via this radical separation of the elements. The boundary between the artist's practice and presence will always be blurred. As a historical comparison, we turn to Marcel Duchamp's happenstance employment of the ready -made. But while Gonzalez Torres borrows this aesthetic of the banal everyday object, he isn't purely Duchamp. He stated, the thing I want to do sometimes in some of these pieces about homosexual desire is to be more inclusive. Every time they see a clock or a stack of paper or a curtain, I want them to think twice. The complication of adding his presence in conversation with this practice blurs these lines and thus has created a perceived division. He is meticulously objective, allowing for the freedom of open-ended interpretation. However, he is also purposefully subjective, undercutting the notions of what it means to be entirely universal or inclusive. The question remains, how do we navigate the surfacing of memorabilia that occurs after the artist's death? Well, the archive of love letters, love letters were left behind specifically by the artist, how do we weigh the materials that have surfaced 
under different circumstances. For instance, in 2010, a project initiated by Bill Bartman, nearly 15 years following the artist's death, we collect snapshots and notes the artist sent to his close confidants in the form of a printed publication. And most recently, in 2016, Carl George, a close friend of Felix and Ross, gifted an archive of private correspondence and ephemera from his friendship with the couple to visual aids in New York. The presence of these materials add to the multiplicity of voices that we must continually navigate in conjunction to his practice over time. The dialectical tension that Gonzales Torres staged allows for this to sustain relevancy, constantly shifting and forming anew, responsive to the contemporary moment. I close with words left to us by Brecht. Even when a character behaves by contradictions, that's only because nobody can be identically the same at two unidentical moments. Changes in his exterior can hinderly lead to an inner reshuffling. The continuity of the ego is a myth. A man is an atom that perpetually breaks up and forms anew. We have to show things as they are. Thank you. terms of the 1868 Bosque Redondo Treaty and to affirm the boundaries of the newly created Navajo Reservation. Juanita, also known as Atsa Tulagi, or Woman Weaver, on your left, goes to serve as an English translator for that delegation. But from this photograph, her role as translator is ambiguous. Here, we see her performing the character of a pacified Navajo weaver, perhaps reenacting an imagined meeting with U.S. Federal Agent Arnie as he claims Navajo land for the U.S. and plants a flag between them. Like the fake boulders, grass, or cloudy sky backdrop in this photograph, it would be easy to dismiss both Juanita's performance and her weaving, titled Loom with Textile by the Smithsonian as just another set construction, a prop. The Smithsonian still describes her work as a sample of Navajo weaving or an unfinished flag blanket. It's heralded in exhibition catalogs as an example of early Navajo patriotism or to mark how Navajo weaving changed during colonialism. And certainly, Loom with Textile is being used on the stage in this photograph to visualize land and relationships that now belong to the U.S. So how else can we possibly read this work? I argue that by analyzing how Juanita wove this flag, by reading the choices she made in the process of creation, these choices change, in fact challenge, the visual rhetoric of both the photograph and the weaving. Through the Move Textile, I believe Juanita takes the stage to tell us a different story, a counter-narrative to U.S. westward colonialism. Woven with the loom bars and yarn bundles still in place, this U.S. flag is unnecessarily under construction. The upper half of the weaving already has 13 red and white alternating stripes and a completed blue rectangle canton. Yet Juanita, in leaving the completed canton, in leaving the completed flag on the loom, exposes how the symbol of the flag is an ongoing construction tied to a machine, the loom, that operates to bury the nations and people with whom it comes in contact. Juanita both visualizes and enacts this burial through the loom, making the flag's visualization 
and operation dependent on her own body and knowledge. A pair of horizontal sticks cleaving the unwoven warp, that's those vertical strands below the flag, are the tools used to weave a of textile. They show Juanita's movement through the weaving, how she chose to weave, and when she chose to stop. Leaving loose yarn bundles embedded in the warp below these rods, Juanita arrests the motion of weaving in the midst of weaving. And through these tools that transform the US flag into a loom, Juanita operates the sign and machine of nation building even as she refuses them. I weave here and no further. To read the flag, not just as an image or symbol, but as a woven construction of refusal, is to understand Juanita's address as two intersecting and competing narratives, materialized in the physical intersection of warp strands and web strands. Okay, too many weaving terms, I'll show you what I mean. When, when Juanita began with textile, it looked like this. This and the next few slides are digital renderings that I manipulated in Photoshop. But they help us to visualize the machine of the loom that Juanita both set up and then wove on. We have colorful blocks of warp strands with bars on either side and rods in the middle. And as soon as Juanita began to weave, these colorful warp strands are concealed by the weaving. The red and white vertical stripes are intersected by red and white horizontal stripes of the flag. Because of this concealment, most mid-19th century Navajo weaving was done on a natural undyed warp. But Juanita draws attention to what weaving hides. According to anthropologist Anne Headland, there are few Navajo weavings on record with a color warp, and none with a warp blocked into multiple color fields. It is my contention that Juanita, in setting up her loom with this warp, knowingly calls her audience's attention away from the flag, away from her woven imagery, to see what lies below it. The woven vertical zigzag stripes reinforce this appeal to notice the buried warp. Woven in near equivalent colors to the color warp, the zigzag stripes mimic the shape of wavy loose strands that twist around and back on themselves as they descend. Through these woven zigzag stripes, Juanita makes visible the shape of the warp that she at the same time is completely obscuring as she leaves. In calling attention to the buried warp through her imagery, in leaving visible that which ought to be erased in weaving, Juanita materializes not just the warp, but her position as actor, weaver, the one responsible for that which is imaged. In other words, in this weaving, to see an image visualized is to also see an image enacted, enacted by her. Let me give you just two examples of how Juanita visualizes and enacts through material, through her body, a narrative of and counter-narrative to colonialism. First, the stars of the canton, that blue rectangle, turned into crosses. While there is much that I could say about the decision to turn stars into crosses, for this example, I will focus on a lone blue star in a field of red. For every white cross that is woven in, Juanita must leave out that much blue yarn from the canton. This material gesture performs the conceptual addition of states onto the flag. For every state added to the US, Something or someone is excluded or extracted. To add a star, to draw a reservation boundary, to put Navajo land in relationship to the US, is to bury or erase an alternative set of relationships to the land that existed before colonialism. Juanita both enacts and refuses this erasure by weaving back in the blue yarn that was extracted. Weaving as a mode of telling performs as it visualizes. Its construction, the woven object, shows us the weaver's body as a documentation of actions in time. In other words, we can trace Juanita's movement through this weaving as though reading a narrative from beginning to end. Except, unlike a narrative, on a page, the finished weaving does not rely on a fixed 
top and bottom, or fixed right and left side, or even front and back. Juanita began weaving loom with textile like this, building the top of the flag from the bottom of the loom. But after weaving 13 red and white horizontal stripes of the flag, she flips the warp around to weave more stripes from the other side. To think about these two sections of weaving like narrative frames, each frame begins with the story of US symbolism and expansion, of red and white horizontal stripes bearing the warp. Well, I read this performance as prompting the audience to acknowledge those who are lost at the intersections of ongoing nation building. I also read it with textile as narrating the compromises made by Juanita and her husband Manuelito in order for the Navajo Nation to survive. To sign the Bosque Redondo Treaty meant the Navajo could finally return to their land after what historian Jennifer Nez de Natale describes as a five year systematic ethnic cleansing. Yet signing the treaty also made the Navajo dependent on the U.S. for their survival. Denatale writes, they did what they had to do in an impossible situation to allow their people to have a future. Juanita's loom enacts this impossible negotiation between dependency and sovereignty. In weaving a U.S. flag and in submitting to the performance of self seen in this photograph, Juanita acquiesces to the role given to her in this domestic dependent relationship. Yet through Loom with Textile, I believe Juanita also embeds resistance strategies into the sign of nation building, constructing a counter narrative of sovereignty. In Loom with Textile, the end of the story is in the middle. As Juanita kept weaving toward the middle, that space of unwoven warp got smaller and smaller, pressing on her hands, pinching her fingers. She was literally getting trapped by her own weaving. Rather than finding a way for the two halves to meet, she excuses herself from entrapment. I read the unwoven warp as Juanita's refusal to be bound either to the symbol of the U.S. flag or the role of Conquer Navajo Weaver. She weaves here and no further. If this were a text, the loose warp is where we encounter the author's pen falling to the page, a word half written. The story ends in silence. Sometimes there are moments that cannot be narrated or visualized, only enacted. Sometimes we are left to weave an emptiness, to weave absent bodies, to catch on silence. And yet, while I see Juanita's use of the loose warp as a rhetorical device to tell her own story, to deconstruct and counter the embedded visual rhetoric of the flag and this photograph, I also see it as a material rhetorical strategy that she uses to appeal to us, to our own embodied knowledges. We may not all be weavers, but we know the motions of layering material on top of another, of the weft moving over and bearing the work. We understand what it means to remove material or bodies that don't fit into a lot of spaces. Remember the blue star. And we have felt what it is like to be squeezed into diminishing spaces, the loose warp in the middle. To analyze Juanita's weaving in this way is to follow her woven actions as tactics for visual disruption. It is to recognize her presence as a material performative counter narrative and as an invitation to embed our own counter narratives into the images, photographs, and histories that would be used to bury us.
So, um, first, first of all, I'm going to comment on which marvelous choices both um, study, the subject of study, fascinating, and also your, your work, your paper, brilliant uh, analysis, um, and very, very helpful too. So, um, since we have a little bit of time, I also would love to hear what the audiences, uh, the questions from the audiences. But first, maybe I'll give you two or three minutes to gather your thoughts. So in this three or, uh, two or three minutes, I will uh, try to uh, give you some thought, my, my thoughts, my comments, and maybe kind of a, a general question. So if there is a Chinese saying, uh, you cast a humble and lowly brick in the hope to attract better jades. <laughs> <laughs>
So in Yongo's artwork, uh, we seem to have this notion of release in some way, right? In whatever I was talking about, your example of the paper, uh, Yongo did the unicorn cafe, and then send it and then release it back to the one um, that, that, that sort of um, uh, process. And um, the, the use of uh, 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 the, the, re the sense of release was relevant to uh, was, uh, was relevant to multiple works in your in that in, that, in your the case you're studying. Um, there's the missionary letter, right? And there's the father's copy of the missionary letter, father's canon, and that was own uh, treatment. So we have multiple authors in this, in this case. And uh, you look at the operative strategy that were at work with this process. You, you introduce the idea of query, diaspora, and market. So I guess I'll just kind of end with this uh, uh, comments with a little question towards you. Um, I wonder how you if you actually give any prime, I don't think you do, but I'd like to hear more about, about what you're thinking. Um, if you give any primacy to certain agencies in this process. For example, do you attribute the power to, you know, we, we're, we're talking about the dirty word market here, even dirtier, the global art market, okay? Um, attribute the power to the global art market to oversee this enactment of those processes? Or do you actually consider um, the multiple agents kind of more in flux with the more kind of uh, uh, not kind of one directional or in your process. And another uh, second note to that question is that the Hanumei picture is, um, uh, it also makes me wonder because we're talking about your, in your uh, conclusion, you talk about familial uh, family business and how this kind of query and the global market kind of uh, transforms that kind of familial um, but the Colombia was obviously political and national and international as well. But the Colombia picture demonstrates that very well. So it's, it's, do you see that more as sort of like organic, multi-directional process, or do you actually want to focus more on the global process uh, overlaying the agency and kind of mapping those processes? Thank you for um, those very generative uh, questions. Um, I think something I find uh, really fascinating about the politics of the art world is that it's uh, this place of extreme disparity, but for people who are in the position that Bo is in now, um, it's almost this uh, place of like, uh, Kind of almost like superhuman agency or something that there's there's a kind of permission given for what an artist of certain stature can do and um, and I think uh, like throughout his work um, before he was as celebrated as he is now he um, kind of uh, took the realm of art and kind of used that to put pressure on the dynamics of the family which is something I find really interesting. And then now he kind of has a stage where he can do that on a kind of a grand scale, um, where it really um, kind of, I guess, uh, collapses or like creates this kind of maelstrom of like pressures between like uh, the market, like uh, kind of global politics, and then like, uh, familial politics or, or interpersonal politics and desire. So they all just become, becomes this kind of arena for all of those things, uh, putting these kind of pressures on each other. Um, and, you know, those things might, those pressures might always have existed, but for him, they take on this performative, almost like operatic scale, I think, when the, when the terrain is like the global art world. And um, I'm going to open up to the audience.
Um, I was thinking of the previous session, sort of blending some of the ideas that held up there, this really interesting group of papers. Um, and so I was thinking about the haptic and how it plays a role in all three of your um, accounts, and how the haptic seems to emerge as a kind of like narrative track switcher, like the narrative can go one way, it's always been driven in the other side the agency of the colonial days or um, the agency of the artist, for instance, but then something happens and it suggests that they can query the John Bow or in the biography of Louis Gonzalez Torres, there's a suggestion of prior intimacy and that seems to sway the reading one way or the other. And then, of course, the optics of reading itself as a site of knowledge. Um, so I was wondering if you all could talk about that a little bit in your various projects. Yeah, I'll start. Um, I think that the haptics
conceptual dimension where touch plays like a very big role that um, he once referred to himself as a container. Um, and so I, I like to think of him as kind of a choreographer and orchestrator of like kind of other trans-historical touches and like ones that span from, you know, these like well-used uh, clients that belong to his grandmother that then become a work of art to uh, say letters of like uh, once written by Robert McNamara or something like that, like the, the touch, uh, it's all of these kind of different historical actors and kind of different scales and their touch becomes part of the practice that he often um, kind of invades or displaces his own touch by, say, um, you know, outsourcing the production of something to a factory or, um, yeah. And so I, and I think with the, the handwriting, Kind of at, at the center, that becomes um, a really interesting site and almost like the most clear example of like the touch or like an embodiment that you could find. But then what happens when you subject that to to these kind of conceptual operations or like um, distancing uh, kind of maneuvers or like the pressures of the market and things like that? What happens to the the mark of the signature, or like the, the hand in that case. Another question here? Just kind of thinking back on this, it's, as you were talking about the theory of touch, kind of in conjunction with our earlier discussion, especially here, flashbacks too, the, the father's copy, copy of the letter, it, it's almost like Historical and past narratives, and to make the 
was in fact meaning that they have not even been legible even at the time of you know, sort of the traces for for a creation. Okay. okay. One more question. Any last question? Um, for for John's sort of um, form, um, but he thinks a lot about um, issues of uh, trace. ways, 
BCS alumni mobilized the skills they honed and the ideas they generated while at CCA in a broad range of creative and professional arenas. The alumni, awards, the alumni Award recipient's work evidences the versatility of the BCS MA degree and is a shining example of the program's luminous community. Before presenting Weston with our coveted bronze pencil, Kara will say some words about his accomplishments and practices. Weston Teruya was born and raised in Honolulu, Hawaii, and currently lives in Oakland, California. As an artist, he has exhibited at the Mills College Art Museum, Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, Southern Exposure, Chinese Culture Center, Longhouse Projects in the New York City Fire Museum, Hiromi Yoshi Gallery, the Atlantic Contemporary Art Center, and the Palo Alto Art Center. Weston has received grants and fellowships from Artadia, Asian Cultural Council, Center for Cultural Innovations Investing in Artists Program, and the Creative Work Fund. He has been an artist in residence with Oxbow, the Lucas Artist Residency at the Montalvo Art Center, Art Practice Ideas at Mills College, the De Young Museum, Recology San Francisco, and Kala Art Institute. Earlier this year, his solo exhibition at the University of Hawaii Manoa titled Expansion, Land, Water, Sky, featured a paper sculptural installation and video that explored the hyperdevelopment of the built environment in the ward and the Kaka'ako neighborhoods on the island of Oahu in Hawaii. This fall, Weston will be part of an exhibition titled In Plain Sight at the Mills College Art Museum. Alongside his studio practice, Weston is one of three founding members of Related Tactics, a collective of artists, writers, curators, and educators of color, creating projects and opportunities at the intersection of race and culture. Related Tactics has recently completed projects at the SFMOMA, Augusta University, and Bampa. Their most recent project, Shelf Life, was reviewed in Hyperallergic. For three years, Weston has hosted and produced Unmaking, a podcast through the online arts criticism and writing platform, Art Practical, that features discussions with artists, art administrators, and cultural workers of color to discuss their lives, practice, and careers. Weston served as an appointed member of the Berkeley Civic Arts Commission, where he chaired the Grants Committee and served on the Policy Committee. He also worked for the Community Investments Program, formerly Cultural Equity Grants, of the San Francisco Arts Commission for eight years. He has been a grant panelist and juror for institutions including the Center for Cultural Innovation, Headland Center for the Arts, Southern Exposure's Alternative Exposure, San Francisco Arts Commission, and Recology San Francisco. Weston received an MFA in Painting and Drawing, an MA in Visual and Critical Studies from California College of the Arts in 2007. His thesis was titled, Do Asian Americans Dream of Techno Pirates? Asian American Identities and Pirate Futurism in Contemporary Art explored the work of three visual artists, Stephanie Sajuko, Glenn Kaino, and Jen Liu, and what the practices suggest for understanding and complicating the frameworks of pirate futurism. His thesis, like all our BCS theses, are available in the CCA libraries to read. Please join Holly and me in welcoming back, and of course, congratulating Weston Truya, our 2019 BCS Alumni Award recipient. Weston, please join us. Being here, listening to the presentations today, and being back in this community has been this wonderful reminder of how it our chance and um, and uh, soul nourishing being in this community has been. And so I hope that this that this is a, a tremendous humbling honor, particularly knowing how many alumni have been folks that I look up to and and I continue to admire um, in our arts. 
community. And so I hope that this speaks to the work that they put into supporting me and you know, folks like uh, Tina Takamoto, who was my thesis advisor, and um, Lydia Matthews, who was the chair of the department at the time. And when I first started here uh, in my MFA, um, told me that I needed to apply for the, to the program because she knew that it would be good for me. Um, folks like uh, Suzette Lin and uh, Sharma Zoda who were my external thesis readers. Um, the, the cohort who was going through the program with me, like Michelle Carlson and um, O.J. Roberts and Sarah Romack and uh, Karen Smith, and then folks who came before me, like uh, Shima Agud, and uh, people who came after me, like Abby Chen, who've been also been very formative in, in shaping how I understand what this practice means out in the world. Um, and you know, this, this is particularly meaning for, meaningful for me because as a total degree, um, there's been, there have been times in the past decade where I've had a hard time identifying for myself the legibility of of visual and critical studies uh, right within my practice. Um, for the most part, I don't maintain the professional markers of the field. I don't write for publication. I don't have an academic practice. Um, I, I, at times, I've thought of uh, visual and critical studies um, more in the general sense that maybe some of what uh, that may be familiar to many dual degrees in that um, it's engaging with critical theories becomes this important way to defend or articulate our work as it goes out into the world, um, you know, to define it for ourselves before others define it for us. Um, but in more recent years, I've come to understand and appreciate the ways that um, the tools that I've gained through visual and critical studies are deeply embedded in my practice and how I navigate the world as an artist and cultural worker. Um, while here at CCA, I actually had two potential thesis uh, topics that I was investigating. Um, the first, which emerged from the research that I was conducting for my studio work, um, was a look at a site in southeast Los Angeles County where a juvenile hall is wrapped in the manicured greens of a public golf course in the middle of the suburban landscape. Um, that juxtaposition of spaces was run by the county probation department and the other by Rocky Parks, while initially jarring and troubling perfectly encapsulates the binaries that shape our broader society. Um, the outside only being possible because of who's kept hidden inside, criminalization, defining freedom, incarceration, enabling leisure. This space also speaks to questions of who is visible or invisible. Until more, the more recent advent of Google Street View, most maps, online or in print, represented the juvenile hall as a blank block in the middle of the named golf course, a mysterious donut hole in the middle of a playground. This cartographic invisibility carries over to the pedestrian view of the landscape where a casual passerby um, might never realize the significance of the buildings that, they, um, that are barely visible through the trees and sand traps. That invisibility in turn functions as a tool to protect property value in the suburb that in its founding documents declared itself as an escape from the taxes and the crime of the big city. After all, how much better for the real estate market to live near a golf course than a carceral space? But by midway through the program, I exhausted most of that writing. Um, it was research that, because it drove my student practice, it was more um, ultimately uh, more effective to, to use other modes to, to continue uh, delving into that work. Um, instead, I ended up shifting gears to write about a framework, um, as you heard, uh, that I called pirate futurism to discuss the work of Asian American artists who use speculative narratives to complicate expectations of loyalty and disloyalty, belonging and expected allegiances. Piracy could be used to describe an artistic practice, the appropriation of elements from pop culture to construct alternative narratives, and an anarchistic social position, as, uh, as with Peter Langwell and Marcus Redeker's invocation of pirates as a polycultural uh, grouping whose Strategic loyalty suggested possibilities of allegiances beyond the restrictions of nation states or regressive institutions. I was working on this near the height of post identity discourse in the art world, and I wanted to explore Asian American artists' work that sometimes resisted attempts to talk about it in relation to fixed identities, to have a framework that could be slippery and expansive, um, but still allow for the acknowledgement of Asian American social politics and legacies of coalition building. Those core, core ideas and the tools I learned in this dissect them are integral to continuing my continuing practice as an artist and cultural worker. Most of my work nowadays is, as a writer is very utilitarian. I write grants and planning documents for cultural organizations. My focus tends to be on the relationship of creative work to arts policy and 
um, gathering resources. For instance, I have an ongoing relationship with Soma Filipinas, the Filipino Cultural Heritage District in the South Market of San Francisco that was formally recognized a few years ago. The neighborhood has been the center for SS Filipino community since the erasure of Militong during the expansion of the financial district. So Filipinas is the formalization of years of organizing against the waves of gentrification that have eroded the community's life in the neighborhood. First with the redevelopment era that hurt the Yerbabuena district, um, then the building of Westfield, and now the current era of high density and luxury investments. Because of its layout, much of the long-term residential life of the neighborhood is in side streets and alleyways, out of view of the commercial corridor and new high-rises. It's also a neighborhood that's always been multi-layered. It's where working-class families, Filipino community, and LGBT folks carved out space together. For instance, the first Folsom Street Fair was themed Megahood, and articulated a vision of being a space where all of these groups could gather together and celebrate in solidarity with the queer leather community celebrating the streets to defy, celebrating in the streets to defy the specter of increasing displacement. So unlike some cultural districts that have arisen from ethnic enclaves, the strategy around keeping place is different and can't rely on existing visibility, density, or monocultural identification. This work in SOMA raises many of the same questions that I've grappled with in visual and critical studies and that continue to be relevant. What are the social dynamics and facets of the built environment that render parts of the community visible? How does this impact policy making and who is prioritized in the neighborhood? And what is the role that culture and art can play in shifting those dynamics? Since this is a polycultural neighborhood, what are the possibilities for coalition building and strategic allegiances that simultaneously leave room for clear districts, uh, clear cultural identities in the district? In my studio practice, I've come to appreciate the ways that visual and critical studies is far more than a defensive tool. When I was in undergrad, uh, I thought the greatest compliment my painting advisor paid me was telling me during thesis reviews, I still don't like your work, but I respect that you can argue for it. <laughs> as I've worked to sustain my practice, I appreciate BCS more and more as a process of learning, of seeing the world, and finding openings to be investigated through different modes, whether through art making or writing. In the MFA process, I remember being told that in the longer arc of our careers, it was more important to use our time in school to find ways to generate new ideas, to understand how we develop concepts, than to create successful work right out of the gate. At the time, I mistakenly thought that this was a studio practice, a studio process, and that I needed to create an expansive visual vocabulary that would solve all my problems. Um, but if anything, I find that it's a process of looking, reading the landscape and archives, um, talking to people, um, and making as well, of course. Um, but as all modes of thinking about place that dig into narratives presented by places and sites um, to understand what they say about belonging, who controls that story, who benefits from those uh, investments, and who can, how we can resist um, the, the pull of those dominant narratives. So thank you again for, for this honor and this recognition. Um, the, I really value visual and critical studies as a way of seeing and conversing with, with the world, um, whose roots are in the textual theory and academic research, but whose outputs and inflections are flexible and grant us the tools to engage with the world as makers, advocates, writers, and members of a community body. Thank you.
All of the students have so skillfully demonstrated why we all appreciate, consume, and need art and visual representation, especially those artworks and projects that powerfully express ideas and life's concerns and that problematize them. Here are my final words today about the Visual and Critical Studies graduate program here at CCA. It was founded in 2000, so next year, 2020, will be our 20th anniversary. In light of that milestone, we will have special programming throughout that calendar year. We will reflect upon what UCS, our students, alumni, and faculty have done over the last two decades. We also will think about the future of visual and critical studies, for we need to think about what questions will engage us in 2030, 2040, and beyond. Watch our website and check out our social media accounts for scheduled events. We'd love to see you there. And now it's time to celebrate our, our presenters at this 2019 symposium. Please join us for some music.